Good morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to ITMI International Business School. Uh, I would like to invite you to look at the screen. Uh, and I would like to invite you uh, to follow the etiquette. Go ahead, uh, Fajri. You can continue. Uh, Lifi, can you? Uh, okay. Um, so I would like to invite you all uh, to re that you follow the social etiquette of a large webinar to everyone's benefit. So please note that this uh, webinar is recorded. Uh, please stay muted. Do not put anything on the screen. Uh, and uh, please submit your question in the Q&A session by way of the link posted in the chat room. So you will see that in the chat room uh, uh, and you will just post your questions there. Uh, upon playing the, uh, the Indonesia Raya, can kindly stand at attention and sit in an upright position, please. And kindly turn off, turn on your video at the end of the program when you are requested. Also, at the end of the program, uh, we will have a, a po post webinar form. Please fill it up. It will be uh, to our benefit all. And those that are going to be needing an e certificate will need to put in their information uh, on that form also. Uh, Fajri, can we continue and uh, to Indonesia Raya and uh, Lifi, please admit the speakers. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to all. You are in a webinar entitled Halal Business Excellence by Design. This is an inter international webinar brought to you by IPMI International Business School in cooperation with the National Committee of Islamic Economy and Finance, or in Bahasa Indonesia, KNEKS, atau Komite Nasional Ekonomi dan Keuangan Syariah. Appropriately and in line with the topic of the morning, we have among us 
one that is very influential in the Islamic economy or the halal industry as it is also called to open our program. He is a reporter, a book writer, researcher, a former head of business administration and, humani and humanities department at the University College of Bahrain. And he is currently also the director of Islamic Economies Supporting Ecosystem at the National Committee of Islamic Economy and Finance. Dr. Su Sutan Emir Hidayat is a very busy person indeed and has an impressive career, career, to say the least, for a young man. But I'm not the only one who says that. He is influential in the halal economy, for he has been listed since 2015 at Islamica 500, a listing of the most influential people in the Islamic economy in the world. And this year, in a pre-published list, Professor Emir, as he is more familiarly called, is listed as the top 50 most influential person in the Islamic Islamica 500. Professor Emir Hidayat, welcome. And if you please, do influence us with your insights. Thank you, Professor Feldi Lewis. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The Honorable Bapak Mustafa, Chairman of IPMI Foundation. The Honorable Professor Aman Wirakarta Kusuma, the Executive Director, IPMI International Business School. Honorable Bapak Sofian Awal, former Executive Director, IPMI International Business School. Professor Derry Habir, and Director of IPMI Case Center. And also Bapak Aldi, Deputy Director of IPMI Case Center. Distinguished Speaker, Professor Marco Tiemen, a renowned expert in halal supply chain management and all participants, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Morning to, good morning to all of you. First, let us praise and thank Allah the Almighty for his grace and mercy. We may gather here virtually in this very special event. Peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the greatest role model of all time for humankind. It is my great pleasure to address all of you at the opening of this international webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, based on the state of the Global Islamic Economy Indicator Report 2019-2020, the global halal market estimated to be worth of 2.2 trillion US dollar while global assets of Islamic finance is projected at 2.5 trillion US dollar in 2018. Simultaneously, the global halal market is estimated to grow at annual rate of 5.2% and is forecasted to reach 3.2 trillion US dollar by 2024 with a significant rise of Muslims spending on halal products and services year after year, Muslims are progressively requiring more businesses to accommodate their halal needs. The halal industry opportunity is captivating multinational producers consider halal as essential and therefore eager to obtain halal certificates. This is indicating the industry's larger viability. Halal certification is one of the essential aspects to, ens to assure products are halal in the, bloom in the bloom of the industry. In Indonesia, the establishment of Act Number no. 33, 2014, concerning halal assurance in the Republic shows the full commitment the government in maximizing the potential of Indonesia halal industry. This act requires businesses to gradually attain halal certification starting from October 17, 2019 for a wide range of products. In this act, product is referred to goods and services that are related to food, 
beverage, drug, I mean medicine, cosmetics, chemical product, biological product, genetically engineered product, as well as consumer goods that are worn, used, or utilized by the public. The mandatory certification will be carried out over five years from or will be carried out over stages. I mean, foods and beverages products halal certification will be carried out over five years from 2019 to 2024, while for pharmaceutical products will be performed over seven years from 2019 to 2026. Ladies and gentlemen, halal certification provides competitive advantages for the businesses, particularly when they incline to grab the Muslim market in many countries. However, halal certification alone may not be enough for the companies to meet the customer expectations. The businesses have to be very efficient and competitive. Similar to normal businesses, halal businesses should also excel in business management, including human resources management, business operation, strategic management, finance management, as well as marketing management. One of the important parts of business management is managing its employees. The employees must have adequate education and knowledge in halal matters so they could understand the problems and issues and formulate relevant solution to assist the halal industry. Appropriate trainings on halal management will ensure that the levels of knowledge and skills are meeting the halal and human capital standards among the halal industry players and hence to be more competitive in business and portraying good halal image. Ladies and gentlemen, to support our national economic development, the Republic of Indonesia aims to take advantage of its huge halal industry potential. On May 2019, the President of Indonesia, His Excellency Joko Widodo, as the Chairman of National Committee for Islamic Economy and Finance, Komite Nasional at the time still Keuangan, Komite Nasional Keuangan, KNKS at the time, launched the Master Plan for Indonesian Islamic Economy 2019-2024, or known as MEKSI, M-E-K-S-I, which is the main reference for the development of Islamic economy and finance in the country. The master plan focuses more on the real sector in terms of halal industry than the earlier launch master plan of Indonesia's Islamic financial architecture, or known MAXI, which focuses on Islamic finance more. The framework of the master plan recommends for main strategies for developing the Islamic economy and finance in the country and realizing Indonesia's vision to be the center of the world's Islamic economy. There are four strategies or four main strategies to achieve the vision of Indonesia in Islamic economy. The first one, strengthening the halal value chain, which is ensuring halal from end to end. Second, strengthening the Islamic financial sector in order to support halal industry, so halal value chain will be achieved. Third, strengthening micro, small, and medium enterprises, MSMEs, as the main driver of halal value chain. Fourth, strengthening digital economic platforms in trade and finance, which are expected to encourage and accelerate the achievement of other strategies. Beside the core players or the various clusters mentioned earlier, supporting ecosystem for the Islamic economy is equally important. Such supporting ecosystem consists of strengthening literacy related to knowledge, awareness, and public education, strengthening human resources, 
strengthening research and development. This all these three IPMI business school can play its important role to support the national agenda, the national aspiration, strengthening fatwas and regulation, and as well governance. All of these supporting ecosystems are crucial in increasing the capacity and scale of the Islamic economy and the national halal industry. So that in the end, it can realize our vision of making Indonesia the world center of Islamic economy and finance. Ladies and gentlemen, to close my opening remark, I encourage and welcome Professor Marco Tieman, a renowned expert in halal supply chain, to share his views and knowledge on this important issue. In order to open our mind and to have better understanding regarding halal business excellence by design. Finally, I do hope all of you will have productive dialogue and fruitful discussion during this webinar. I'm pretty sure that the, the, the dialogue and discussion will contribute to the successful of halal industry in Indonesia. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Emir. And now, to start our program, although not yet listed as in, on any global list of in, influential people, our moderator today, Dr. Deri Habir, has a steady, long, and strong influence on our beloved school. For anyone who was ever a student in his class and can attest that he is a teacher at heart and that is what he lives for. His students will further say they remember him and his teachings, even everything else is forgotten. One of the reasons is the case method of teaching that he applies and that IPMI has adopted from Harvard Business School and INSEAD, the schools that that were influential in the early development of the business school. The case method today is still used and developed by these leading business schools and others in the world for the case method is student-centered learning, the pedagogy of choice to achieve the best learning outcome. And Professor Habir, as one of the founding faculty of the school who brought the case method of teaching to IPMI is currently the director of the case center the office that carries the torch of teaching excellence to the next generation of faculty at IPMI. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Deri Habir, our moderator. Thank you, Ali, for that uh, introduction. I, uh, I should, uh, in, in, in return, I should tell everybody that you, you were also in my class one a uh, long time ago and that you were the best student in the class. So that's just to, uh, make sure people know what uh, what you're on about. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Marco Thiemann is no stranger to uh, IPMI. He has uh, uh, appeared in a, a webinar before, and that was with uh, our um, uh, opening uh, uh, speaker, uh, Professor uh, Sultan Emir Hidayat. Um, I almost feel like I don't have to introduce uh, Professor Thiemann because uh, uh, Professor Emir did such a a good job. However, there's some of you here, many of you may not know uh, the background of uh, Professor Thiemann, so um, I will be going through his uh, introduction uh, of his background as a founder and CEO of LBB International, a supply chain strategy consulting and research firm. Um, the, the, the company and the professor has uh, assisted uh, governments and private sector on halal production, halal logistics and supply chain management, halal park development and halal risk and reputation management. He has been advising to major halal projects in Asia, Middle East and Europe and in Indonesia. Um, Professor Timan is the project director of Modern Halal Valley, a 500 hectares halal industrial and logistics cluster development, which he described in his uh, uh, former um, uh, presentation with us uh, before. In fact, we are hoping that that will become one of the 
cases that uh, we might be able to teach in the future. Uh, professor Timan is a full professor at Elm Graduate School of Health University in Malaysia, in charge of research on halal supply chain management and halal risk and reputation management. He is research fellow with the University of Malaya Halal Research Center, conducting research on halal supply chain management. He is furthermore adjunct professor with University of Malaysia Pahang, Kuantan, involved in research on halal blockchains. He is a prolific, prolific academic writer uh, on, on the topic of uh, uh, halal uh, management. And in fact, recently he has, been, uh, he has uh, written and um, uh, is, is uh, issuing his book on halal business management, a guide to achieving halal excellence, which he will be talking about uh, uh, today as well. And it will have uh, some relationship with uh, IPMI, I'm pretty sure. Um, he is on the board of the senior he is on the senior editorial advisory board of the Journal of Islamic Marketing um, in from the from the UK. So, um, finally, Professor Timon has a master's of science in industrial engineering and management science logistics from the University of Twente, Twente in the uh, Netherlands, and a PhD in business management. Um, halal supply chain management from the University Technology Mara in uh, Malaysia. I was saving the last uh, bit uh, for uh, uh, to because it's not yet formal, but uh, I would like to announce uh, that uh, uh, Professor uh, Timan has accepted our invitation to be senior uh, visiting fellow at uh, at IPMI Case Center, and we look forward to a continuing relationship with uh, uh, with him. Um, for those of you who uh, enjoy um, walking, enjoy sailing, and enjoy uh, jazz music, you can enjoy it with uh, Professor Timon, uh, but not right now, because for, uh, right now you will be enjoying his uh, presentation. Professor Timon, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Derry. Uh, I would like to thank uh, IPMI. Uh, for inviting me and also KNAKS for inviting me at this esteemed uh, platform. It's a great honor also to be associated with IPMI and I look forward to uh, working together with the professors there and also the students as uh, one of the leading business schools here in Asia. Um, so this uh, webinar, uh, I'm looking at the topic of halal business excellence uh, by design. And as uh, Prof. Derry uh, shared already, I've been working on my book and I will be sharing a kind of prelude uh, to, to halal business uh, management. Um, I will be sharing, uh, putting up my slides. I hope uh, you can all um, see them. Um, I will be uh, covering, first of all, we live in interesting times. I will be covering some aspects, my point of view on, on the halal industry. Uh, secondly, uh, related to my book, uh, talking about uh, halal business excellence, it's good to share with you uh, the halal excellence uh, philosophy. Furthermore, I will be sharing about the concept of halal trust, halal risk management, halal reputation management, halal business management education. And of course, I look forward to, to your questions and a dialogue on these important uh, topics. Um, First of all, to look at the halal industry. Um, yes, there are a lot of issues in the halal industry, but at the same time, we have to see halal issues as opportunities. So we talk about issues and problems. Uh, for business people, this means opportunities. I think first of all, it's good to realize uh, in my work uh, for multinationals and large companies uh, to get halal certified, there's a systemic shortage of halal ingredients and additives with the right halal standards. The moment you get halal certified, your halal ingredients need to comply with the requirements of the halal certification body. The halal certification body will only recognize a limited number of halal certification bodies. And industries, they source ingredients and additives all over the world. So there's a shortage of halal ingredients and additives with the right halal standards. Secondly, um, a lot of uh, OIC countries, uh, Islamic countries, they are very much dependent on imports. Uh, uh, with only the exception of a few OIC countries, maybe 
a country like, like Turkey, where all the countries, they are very dependent on basic, even basic food imports. Uh, the big brands today, if you talk about the big brands today, the big, biggest halal food company is, is Nestle, you know? Um, so uh, there's a shortage of, of businesses, uh, multinationals from the Muslim world. Uh, what we see that halal industries are highly fragmented, um, small. Uh, we have a lot of micro SMEs, SMEs in the halal space. Uh, they, they compete instead of working together. Uh, so I think there are areas for collaboration, uh, leveraging on that, on cooperation with different uh, industries. And it seems they have difficulty to go to the next level from micro SME to SME, from SME to large, from large to multinational. Um, yeah, so there are a few uh, global halal brands uh, from uh, Muslim countries. Uh, that I told you earlier, uh, Nestle is the largest halal food uh, company, uh, but also in ingredients. If you look at the list of who are the top uh, ingredients and additive produced in the world, there's none from the Muslim world. Uh, so there's an opportunity. Finally, uh, as what I have been uh, sharing with my students and on different platforms is halal is dynamic, it's not static. Halal is moving from a, a product approach towards a supply chain and value chain approach. Halal needs to be addressed, not only at the slaughter plant or at the production plant, but end to end, similar to food safety. So it's important also what Dr. Sultan from KNAKS shared, yeah, that Indonesia is building that ecosystem, that halal ecosystem is so important because a halal supply chain, a value chain is very difficult to manage without a halal ecosystem. Um, so then suddenly earlier this year, we had the Corona crisis coming in, which is unfortunately a very big issue in Indonesia with a lot of raising cases. What the Corona situation did, it was amplifying the problems in the Islamic industry. I was at the webinar uh, last month, an international webinar uh, with many big uh, halal authorities uh, in there, speakers from the Muslim world, uh, on the impact of Corona and uh, the, the, the halal industry and the Muslim countries. And I thought this was a very important webinar and I was expecting action an action plan yeah, because so many Islamic countries are dependent on imports and, and they will face uh, hunger uh, when those supply chains are cut. And, but instead they're talking about, uh, we were so happy that we managed to uh, put funds uh, to make sure that our supermarkets were full. And there was no action plan. I thought we have to wake up. We have to produce halal. Yes, it's mandatory to consume halal, but there's an equal responsibility yeah, to produce halal. So we need to get into action. And Indonesia is one of the few countries where this government strategy to create a halal production hub, yeah, that we, instead of importing, is that we should be exporting halal, bring halal to the world. And uh, I'm very uh, uh, impressed uh, with the, the government strategy of Indonesia to, to make this happen. And I'm very privileged uh, to be also uh, part of this direction with modern Halal Valley. Um, so what is the real problem, I think, in the Muslim world is, is that we don't educate uh, the new business elites on, on Halal business management. Uh, if you do a conventional MBA program, you learn nothing about Halal. Only when you go they are very interested to, to learn about Islam or Islamic finance. You, you learn about halal. But if you do a conventional master degree in business, uh, MBA, um, you don't learn about halal. So uh, maybe that's also the reason why uh, there are low ambition levels in the halal industry in the Muslim world and, and maybe even low business standards. So. I think it's very urgent that we are educating the people on what halal excellence is about. And it's already in the Holy Quran, the word isan, uh, striving uh, for, for excellence, not only in praying, but in everything you do. So we also should apply that uh, to, to business management. So in my book, uh, I developed a halal excellence uh, philosophy 
Um, I think halal excellence is important to, to realize that halal excellence is the pursuit of halal excellence. It, it's a process. Um, it is a rational series of steps and action. Uh, it also requires dedication. It requires focus. It requires teamwork. It requires practice and it requires repetition. It is not something easy to do. It's hard work. So why do we need exactly halal excellence? Well, in the, core, the core purpose of, of uh, halal excellence is to, to serve uh, the humanity, the world, with products, as well as services that are lawful and good, uh, the so-called halal and toya. So that is an important reason why uh, halal excellence is needed. We want to produce halal for the world. So what are important components in, in halal excellence? Uh, I developed uh, seven important uh, components of, of halal excellence. The first uh, component is uh, we should have no compromises on any inputs and in the processes involved. So if you talk about inputs, we talk about the ingredients, the materials that consist in the food or the cosmetic product or the pharmaceutical product. So what do you put into the halal product? We should not have any compromises that endanger our health, for example, or endanger the halal integrity. We also need to have good equipment because your product is as good as your ingredient, but also as the equipment you're using. And the people, the people are so important in here. And you can argue, we go all online and on the internet. At the end, you know, it's people, it's halal products and, and processes and services. It is still people business. So we need to educate uh, the people um, in the company. Um, uh, also, your suppliers you need to educate, and your supply chain partners, and even the board of directors you need to be educated on halal. Secondly, the process. Uh, so you have business processes, and, and a lot of companies have an ISO, a so-called quality management system. And so halal also needs to be embedded into the day-to-day -day processes. So halal excellence is, first of all, looking at no compromises on what you put in, and what makes the product or services, but also have the actual business processes. Um, secondly, how excellence needs to be embedded by design. Uh, uh, I call that uh, so-called C4, and C4 stands for correct, consistent, complete, and clear. Uh, an halal assurance system. Uh, so when you want to get halal certified, you have to develop an halal assurance system. That needs to be C4 but also your supply chain. How long needs to be extended throughout the supply chain, end to end from source, all the way to the point of consumer purchase, where it is handed over to the consumer. Also about how long branding and marketing is important. You can make a lot of mistakes in branding and marketing that will be affecting uh, the, your product and, and your sales and success. Also on about the risk and reputation management, a lot of uh, people have risk reports, but this halal uh, part of that. So protecting your halal reputation is an important aspect in, uh, in halal business management, which I've done a lot of work in research as a researcher over the past uh, five years. Um, practice and repetition is essential uh, of the halal assurance system of uh, risk management and also reputation management. So practice and repetition. So you should have it all well documented, but also practice uh, what you have documented and don't wait uh, for the issue to happen and then it is too late. Uh, also important uh, to, to manage your halal supply chain and your corporate halal reputation. And the only way to manage that is that you measure also that. So, Similar to a car, you have a cockpit in front of you with meters of the speed, the temperature of the oil and your petrol, full or empty. You also need to have key performance indicators in your company regarding halal. And that is of the essence. So having the right key performance indicators for your company. 
Um, number five is having the best team uh, is extremely important because halal is people business. So having the right people in your company, the board of directors, uh, also your partners you choose in your supply chain, so your suppliers, but also your distributors, your retailers. Are they protecting the halal integrity also when they sell it online or are they mixing halal and non-halal uh, by that uh, e-business company? And also your external uh, stakeholders are important. Right? Your, your relationship with your halal certification body and Muslim uh, associations, for example, in your markets. Also your engagement with the end customer. Uh, yeah, we talk about co-creation where together uh, with the Muslim community, you can develop new, new products and new services. It's also part of uh, halal excellence. Um, and the final uh, aspect um, is in balance with nature. So halal excellence is also about sustainability. And, and uh, Ibrahim Abdul Martin is an American writer. He wrote about uh, the green dean, uh, the earth is a mosque. Really a great book uh, I recommend uh, uh, about how Islam teaches about protecting the planet. Very important book. And it's also part of, uh, of halal excellence that you are in balance uh, with, with nature. Um, one of the areas I've been working on is, is measuring of um, the halal uh, reputation and also the consumer perspective. Um, a lot of, in the academic world, a lot of uh, consumer service has been done uh, to, to find out what is the uh, buying behavior of the Muslim consumer. And they quote often the term halal trust. Um, but I have say, seen very few academic papers that really clearly define what halal trust is about. So I have defined as following the belief of the Muslim consumer in the halal integrity of the product or service in accordance to his or her faith. So this is the definition of halal trust. Um, the important thing is, it is important to measure. So how can we measure that? So I developed a halal trust iceberg yeah, to, yeah, to, to create a measurement tool to measure halal trust of, of a certain brand. So often uh, in the consumer service that I see, the halal trust of a brand is measured by, does the consumer trust the halal logo? And so the MUI logo, a worldwide famous. And so the MUI logo is a trusted as compared to a logo, for example, from uh, France, which nobody knows. Um, so there is a difference in trust. But there are more aspects to the trust of the Muslim consumer in a brand. It's not only the credibility of the halal certificate, but also is excellence embedded into the brand owner. Are they working at the highest standards of, of food safety, of quality? Um, are the products religiously pure services? And then the aspect of transparency. Um, in case of an halal issue, is the brand owner transparent and clear and honest eh, what happened? So can the Muslim consumer believe eh, what, whatever the company says? Another aspect in halal trust is also halal authenticity. The, what is the halal DNA of the company? It's only they are certified eh, by a uh, good halal authority, but do they also have an, a thorough halal strategy, halal policy? Um, how do they address the Islamic values, the norms and the ideals of the Muslim faith? Um, are they just meeting the existing halal standard requirements or are they exceeding uh, halal standards? And finally, intention. Uh, what is the uh, intention is the foundation of confession, you can argue. So what is the intention, the honesty of a company uh, in the halal space? Can the Muslim consumer uh, respect this company? Uh, so we developed an algorithm uh, to measure halal trust of the Muslim consumers of, of brands. And that's something which we are launching uh, soon. And it can also be read in my book about uh, how to measure uh, halal trust. Um, a related area to halal trust is, is risk management, which I uh, developed a lot of, um, uh, um, or did a lot of research in as an academic over the past uh, five years. Um, 
so what is uh, what are important halal issues? Well, uh, what we have noticed that there have been a lot of crises over the past uh, years uh, by local companies, but also by very big multinational companies that were uh, in trouble, uh, where the, the Muslim consumer didn't trust anymore uh, their uh, products and uh, were even uh, boycotting brands, which is very sad, of course, for those uh, brand owners. So what you see is that because the halal industry is getting so big uh, that we see that a lot of more halal issues are popping up. Uh, halal supply chains are complex and it might be also difficult to detect, but once they are exposed and they also, uh, they can go viral. Uh, in the old days, it's only professors, uh, educators like myself uh, that can publish, but nowadays everybody has a handphone and become its own publisher. Um, and it doesn't matter anymore if it's true or not. Uh, it will, uh, even if it's not true, that even goes faster as and go viral and damaging brands. And, and a lot of brands, uh, they might have lost millions uh, in, in US dollar um, terms, uh, in terms of sales losses and reputation damages. So it is something very important to um, address uh, in uh, business. Um, so initially, the halal industry was um, based on, on food. But we have now seen that next to food, also cosmetics can be halal certified, pharmaceutical, paint, uh, fashion, and many more products. So we have seen that the halal industry is growing in width, as I called it. Secondly, a lot of companies are now embracing halal certification. It was initially food, but, but also in cosmetics, you see more companies going certification, also multinationals. Um, so what we have seen uh, that, that over the years, there's also a scaling up of halal issues because the halal industry has grown. Um, and also uh, just explained um, also by Dr. Sultan is that the halal industry is growing so fast. Why? Because it's growing in width and in depth. So therefore, uh, the hollow issues uh, are also increasing. Therefore, it's important uh, to, to manage that well uh, because um, halal supply chains are all interconnected. Yeah? So one company is connected uh, to another company. So they are globally integrated uh, systems. You see also that factories are producing multiple brands from the same location. So it's making halal the supply chain very complex. There's also an aspect which I normally share uh, during my master classes uh, with, with students is the issue of, of correlation. Uh, so for example, if you go to McDonald's, you also may see Coca-Cola, right? So that's correlation. If there's an issue with Coca-Cola, it will also affect McDonald's or the way around. What you also have in certain products, uh, they promote the ingredient. There's a special ingredient, uh, vitamin A from a DSM is a big ingredient producer. If there's an issue with an ingredient producer, it will also affect uh, the, uh, the brand or the way around. Um, so correlation is an important factor in, in halal risk management to, to address. Uh, there might also be a halal industry issue that in the fast food, uh, that uh, in the frying of uh, French fries so that certain ingredients might be non-halal. So if one company is doing that and has been exposed, the Muslim consumer thinks, what about those other companies? Are they also doing the same? So one issue in one company in an industry might affect uh, the halal issue uh, for, for the whole industry uh, as a whole. Um, and so risk management is uh, therefore extremely important uh, to, to address in, uh, for businesses if they want to be um, good and successful uh, in this halal space and be a global player. Um, what I find, however, is that a lot of uh, risk management practices of uh, large company and also multinational are passive. They say, well, what we have done, uh, we created a halal assurance system. Uh, we are certified uh, by the best uh, halal certification bodies of meeting the, the current standard, and that is good enough. Well, then I have a wake up call for you. <laughs> um, it's good you have a halal assurance system in place. 
but the hollow assurance system alone is not sufficient. It will fall either left or right ways. Um, so when you talk about an hollow assurance system, it needs to be supported by other important elements. And one of those elements is prevention by creating a robust uh, supply chain uh, that you're looking at how do we organize our purchasing? Uh, who are the partners in our supply chain? How do I address uh, storage and transport uh, in the supply chain? Are these guys hollow certified? Do I have it addressed in contracts? So risk prevention is extremely important. And here we talk about excellence, process excellence, choosing the right uh, partners. A second component is, is uh, mitigation. So if there is a hollow issue, what are your reactions? And the faster do you react and the better you have documented uh, in proper risk and uh, risk mitigation management, the, the better your action is. And the faster you are, the better you can isolate the issue and avoid becoming it rolling into a global crisis. Um, thirdly, we talk about uh, recovery. So if there is the unfortunate situation of a halal crisis, how can we best uh, restore the, the reputation of the company, in particular the trust, the halal trust of the consumer in your product or service, uh, restore the Islamic values and also uh, the entire network. So in short, halal assurance system and that is compliant uh, to a good hollow certification standard of a good hollow certification body is not sufficient. Uh, what they found in my work uh, for big companies is that um, they have crisis manuals. Uh, we, 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 we see a lot of pages about what to do uh, when the CEO is kidnapped, which of course <laughs> is, is very important to, to address. But then, then you look at where's the halal section and they sometimes see just one or two sentences on halal or not at all, or they treat halal as a um, contamination issue. You find a piece of metal in the, this product. Um, halal is not the same as a uh, contamination issue. It should never uh, be treated like that. And until today, I've, I've, I've worked more than um, 10, 15 years uh, in uh, advising the industry on this. Until today, I haven't seen a, a good uh, crisis manual until today. Uh, so I think a lot of work needs to be done by businesses to take halal serious uh, beyond purely compliance to the uh, current requirements of your halal certification body. You have to do more than that. Um, so halal risk management is related to uh, halal reputation management. If you look at the biggest companies, um, a halal reputation represents uh, uh, a lion's share of the market value of companies, 40%. And like for big multinational like Unilever can be more than 50%. So reputation is extremely important. So is halal reputation. Uh, so what is the problem today is that uh, Muslims uh, are all well connected and they are not very well prepared uh, to tolerate um, risk and halal issues. They want a zero risk halal environment or preferably a near zero risk environment. The point, if there is an issue with a company or brand so that it all goes viral and they will also boycott brands and use all the media they have at the power to, to, to get support for, for boycotts. Uh, so this is a serious concern huh, for, for companies that want to go big into the halal industry. So they need to protect themselves. They need to understand huh, what a halal reputation is, what kind of measures are required huh, to put in place huh, to protect uh, your halal reputation. Uh, I defined halal reputation as a collective representation of the firm's past actions and also halal performance but also the future ability to meet HALO requirements. So both in perspective of the past, what I have done as a firm, a company, what my current uh, performance is, my HALO performance, excellence performance, but also how good will I be able uh, to meet uh, the, the future requirements uh, of, of the HALO industry. Um, so if you talk about an HALO uh, reputation, um, 
uh, a good hollow reputation is, is of benefit to companies. It will uh, secure uh, good sales. And so the higher your hollow reputation is, the higher your sales is in Muslim markets. Secondly, if there is a hollow issue, uh, people will be also um, respecting uh, better the organization and will be probably have less negative reactions regarding your brand. So it is a kind of buffer in cases of a halal issue or, or crisis. Um, however, you always have to realize eh, that uh, you always need to be transparent. You always need to share uh, your halal DNA as a company in times of, of trouble uh, so that the Muslim consumer can, can believe you. So uh, purely a, an initial halal reputation is good to have, but you still need to have your SOPs in place to, to uh, protect uh, your hollow reputation in all kinds of scenarios. Um, if you talk about hollow reputation, a lot of companies uh, conduct a survey to understand uh, how does the Muslim consumer look at my brand uh, today? Do they trust uh, my, my hamburgers or my french fries or my cosmetics products? Uh, that is a very um, uh, momental reflection of, of the, the current situation, how the consumer looked at you. Uh, but that's not enough because it's like driving a Ferrari on the highway by only looking at your, your, your rear mirror. That's not good enough. So you need to develop a uh, halal reputation indicator and measurement uh, based on a more uh, rational uh, perspective, a more robust and rational perspective. It is not only uh, addressing the the uh, past perspective, the current perspective, but also gives you guidance as KPI for the future, which is very important for your halal management team, your halal committee, but also for uh, for top management. You know. So I drafted and created a key performance indicator for this. Um, and therefore, it's important uh, to, to use that uh, because what gets measured gets always accomplished. Um, I developed um, the Hollow Reputation Index, which has uh, four um, important drivers. Um, the first driver is Hollow Authenticity. What is your Hollow DNA? Uh, so do you have a Hollow uh, policy in place, a Hollow strategy? Um, how is your alignment, your internal alignment within your uh, own company, but also your supply chain? And what is the level of maturity of the company? Are you just looking at, are you halal certified or not? Is, do you have a product approach to halal? Or are you already addressing the uh, entire uh, supply chain? Um, a second driver in, in halal reputation is uh, the halal certification body you're using. So um, the, the halal certification from Indonesia, uh, from Majulis Sulama Indonesia or BPAPH, the new organization that has a world-class reputation. Uh, I come from Holland in Europe and we have many hollow certification bodies. Uh, we don't have added accreditation in, in Holland of hollow certification bodies. Every uh, Dick, Tom and Harry can uh, set up his own certification body and, claim and start issuing certificates. So a certificate uh, not recognized by anybody just set up by uh, by a person going to the Chamber of Commerce will have a different uh, uh, value as compared uh, from uh, MUI. Um, so if you use um, a better halal certification body, a better halal certificate, you will have a, halal, a better halal uh, reputation as compared to a an, uh, an, uh, Mickey Mouse uh, halal certificate. Uh, yeah. Um, a third driver is, is the messages by the company and also your supply chain partners, which is something in your own control. Um, so is there a hollow reputation strategy? Uh, are there handbooks uh, uh, in case there is a hollow issue? Are there handbooks uh, for uh, hollow crisis? Uh, are these in place or not? So the better those handbooks are, those manuals, uh, the better is your hollow reputation. Finally, what happens outside? So what are the messages we can find on the internet? Uh, what is the current media coverage? Um, and what is the uh, connectivity to the Muslim communities? And what is the corporate track record also on halal issues? If you had an issue, what can happen? 
how did you came out of that halal issue as a winner or did you make the wrong decision so you came out as a loser so that will determine uh, the halal reputation index and therefore also the halal reputation of the company so 10 key indicators and uh, based on, on four key drivers will be de uh, develop your halal reputation of of the company uh, so this will lead uh, to a uh, ranking and rating system that is good uh, to have the dashboard uh, as top management when you're operating in Muslim markets. It's good, however, to, to realize um, how this relates to the actual market development. So then I talk about uh, the, the license to operate. So companies serving Muslim markets they need to earn the license to operate. So a key, key driver sir, for the uh, license to operate is the ability uh, how to anticipate uh, those hollow market requirements of your market. So you can have an LTO rating for Indonesia and you can have an LTO rating for Malaysia or an LTO rating for Saudi Arabia if you're exporting Saudi Arabia. It's important to monitor the, uh, your LTO rating uh, as a brand owner if you're uh, um, active in multiple markets because there might be a new local fatwa issued in the market you're operating in that has implications on the uh, how the Muslim consumer will treat your product as halal or not or in a gray area. What is the list of which halal certification bodies are recognized by that market? Uh, all these components will have uh, or a new halal standard that's being developed in that Muslim country. So all those aspects will have impact on your license to operate. Um, finally, um, a question uh, I often get uh, from, from companies is, is how to start uh, with, with halal reputation in an organization. Um, so I developed a um, halal reputation uh, journey. Uh, as, as a kind of guideline how to, to start and how to develop uh, halal reputation management in your company. Um, I believe a, a first step is, uh, is to develop a halal reputation strategy. Is, uh, you identify, well, you better do something about the halal reputation. It's very risky to do business in Muslim markets. So halal reputation is a problem we need to address urgently. So create a strategy, what we should do as, a, as an organization. Um, a second um, step is start measuring your halal reputation. So measure uh, your halal reputation index. Uh, measure uh, your halal uh, sorry, license to operate uh, rating uh, as a company. Uh, in this way, uh, you treat halal reputation as an asset of value. And we will start measuring that to make sure that we are further strengthening the, the halal asset. Um, the third step for companies is to look at uh, building a cross-functional team uh, to address how can we improve uh, our halal reputation. So actively forming a team, um, a cross-functional team from different departments uh, that work, okay, uh, we have to uh, uh, improve uh, the, the, the messaging, internal messaging. So how can we strengthen that with our supply chain partners? We draft an action plan and implement it and then you can see that your halal reputation index will increase at the next uh, measurement the final step is to bring halal reputation at board level right so maybe even create a, a position as a chief halal reputation officer for a company where you see you really can see that halal reputation is really a differentiator in our market and we really have to monitor this at the, the highest level in an organization at board level. You know? um, so what are some key lessons I would like to share with you on, uh, on hollow reputation management and risk management? I think it's good to, to realize that, that halal is, is, is complex. It needs to be addressed uh, by design in order to protect uh, your license uh, to operate. Um, a good halal reputation also comes from creating a very strong halal DNA. So living the actual Islamic values, making the right decisions at the right time. So your risk 
parallel risk and mitigation is extremely important. So create those blueprints uh, to, 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 to know what to do uh, when there is a hollow issue or when it becomes a crisis that you have a proper crisis uh, manual, manual in place. Um, I think uh, what I see in the halal industry that a lot of, especially foreign companies, they say, well, uh, we do everything minimal. We just uh, meet the current requirements of halal certification body, right? We have a beautiful certificate uh, from MUI, Majlis Islam in Indonesia. They're proud of it. And they just follow what are the requirements from MUI. It's extremely dangerous to do this because... Uh, halal standards develop, there are new fatwas. So it's important to have and build a halal system and halal assurance system that is proactive, right? It is exceeding existing standards because if a halal certification body uh, start enforcing uh, new requirements or existing requirements, but start enforcing that like in halal transport and, and, and halal storage, then you are in trouble because some companies are so big, they cannot amend to a new requirement in just a month time. It probably needs six months time to restructure their supply chain. So if you want to be successful, you cannot afford to be reactive in, in, in meeting halal requirements. So you need to exceed halal standards. Uh, so it's also good to address halal throughout your supply chain to be selective there, which, uh, which partners uh, you choose in your, uh, in your supply chain, in your network, uh, uh, because uh, issues can not only be caused by you as a company, but also by your supply chain partners. So uh, choose your partners, uh, like in a marriage, uh, choose your wife <laughs> carefully. Um, and finally, I think education is important. So I'm very uh, privileged uh, to work with uh, IPMI uh, to educate the new generation of business elites on the importance of, uh, of halal um, business management. Um, so I've been sharing with you, I've been uh, working on my book, uh, Halal Business Management, a guide to achieving halal excellence. Um, hopefully it will be uh, this December uh, in the bookshops, also in Indonesia. Uh, so in this book, I will be sharing um, 10 important topics. I'll be covering, uh, first of all, the world of halal, what are the opportunities in the halal industry? What are expected? Uh, what is expected from the Muslim world to, to work on? Uh, also talking about halal certifications. I've been um, advising uh, many companies uh, on also the Indonesian halal certification. Some of my clients, they, they came to me, Marco, which halal certification should we use? And I'd advise them to use uh, one of our clients, uh, MUI globally. So there are of that client already more than 35 companies, uh, factories all over the world are certified doing, using MUI halal certificate. Um, so I will be talking in a chapter about how you develop a solid, uh, robust uh, halal assurance system. Um, the second part of my book, I talk about halal supply chain management, covering what is a halal supply chain, how to choose your partners wisely, uh, but also on halal purchasing. So when you want to get halal certified, all the problems go to the purchasing department uh, to make sure uh, that the right ingredients are, are chosen, uh, that are allowed, but also that that comes with the right halal certificates. So purchasing is one of the most complex discipline uh, of a halal uh, comp of a company that wants to go for certification or is already uh, halal certified. Um, I also will be talking about halal logistics and halal retailing, about halal clusters, the halal park. Uh, the halal park I'm currently uh, very privileged uh, to to work with uh, is the modern halal valley in Indonesia. There's definitely a, a case example, a global case example, how to organize a halal cluster. Um, then I will be sharing about halal branding and marketing in the third uh, part of my book, uh, talking about marketing mistakes, uh, what is branding halal, how to brand halal in a Muslim country and, and non-Muslim countries. And finally, about uh, halal risk and, and reputation management, which has been uh, my focus, kind of focus over the past five years in my academic research, so it will show at the latest uh, research findings for my work 
in, uh, in Halal Risk and, uh, and Reputation Management. Um, my publisher, Routledge, is currently in discussion with uh, some publishers in Indonesia uh, to translate the book in Bahasa Indonesia as well. So, uh, God willing, uh, we can also uh, introduce a uh, Bahasa Indonesia uh, version also uh, next year. So, that is still in, uh, in discussion. Um, uh, at IPMI, uh, uh, the case center, we are very uh, pleased uh, to share uh, with all of the participants that we are working on developing an, uh, an executive education, uh, sharing halal business management uh, with, uh, with students, uh, both from the private sector as well as, uh, as, well as graduates. Uh, we would like uh, to, to share the important topics of uh, halal purchasing, uh, halal logistics and retailing, uh, halal supply chain management, uh, halal branding and marketing, and uh, halal risk and reputation management. So I would advise all of you uh, to, to keep track of the IPMI website uh, when those uh, uh, executive education uh, trainings uh, will be held uh, in, the, in, coming, uh, in coming six uh, to, to eight months. Um, Yes, this was my, uh, my, my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for, for listening to my talk and your interest in, in Halal business management. Uh, I look forward uh, for, for meeting you in person and I hope uh, that the corona issue is, uh, is going away soon. Uh, but let's start uh, a discussion on questions you have uh, on, uh, on Halal business management. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Thiemann. Uh, we've been having a, a bit of a problem uh, on uh, connection, uh, but I hope this will not uh, disturb the questions uh, and answers. Generally speaking, we never have enough time for questions, so I will not go too deep uh, into uh, uh, summarizing what you have uh, uh, talked about, just to point out uh, the, the, the philosophical um, uh, background that is needed before one gets into the the, the complexities of uh, uh, halal business uh, business management. Uh, IPMI has always been proud of uh, practitioner uh, and academic orientation, and I think uh, you brought out very well um, in your in, in your talk the practicalities of um, of the halal business uh, management, uh, but also in an academic sense, uh, the research required, the complexities that are involved. And uh, because of that, uh, I think we need to have the questions in order to smooth out the complexity. So, uh, uh, Aldi, uh, Aldi, will you be uh, handling the, the questions and we can uh, help you out over there? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Habir and Professor Thiemann. Uh, uh, very enlightening, of course. Uh, I have uh, learned a lot and I'll have, I have learned also that it's quite complex. Uh, it's not enough, uh, as you say, to have the DNA, but also uh, you need to uh, uh, want to uh, do it properly and have uh, the system in place. Um, so we have many, many uh, questions uh, and like uh, Prof. Derry said, uh, we've been having some problems to connect, but I'm going to put up uh, a few of those. Well, let me read you uh, a few questions before I can put them up. Um, okay. Shall I, shall I start with the questions? Uh, uh, oh, you, already, that? you have them? I've got okay. some of them. So. Uh, uh, Professor Thiemann, there's one question from uh, uh, Ahmad Kamal Badri. Uh, trust in the halal label important to Muslims will also comfort the non-Muslim co consumer. What will be the expectations of non-Muslims vis-a-vis the halal label? Will the halal label be meaningful only to Muslims or will it have a universal value? Uh, very important. Uh, thank, thank you, Mama Kamal, uh, for this question. I think uh, the halal label is extremely important for the Muslim consumer. And in my book also, I talk about how to brand halal also in non-Muslim markets. Yeah? So in Muslim markets, evident important. But 
if you brand the Halal logo too big in non-Muslim markets, you might have boycotts also uh, from non-Muslims that say we, uh, uh, there is the, the understanding that halal slaughter is cruel for animals. So, so if you do wrongly promotion of halal in non-Muslim markets, it might hit you also with boycotts against you. So branding halal is, needs to be very refined and you do that differently for Muslim markets and non-Muslim markets. So there in my classes, I will go into detail on this, how best to brand halal. And there are differences for Muslim markets and non-Muslim markets. In non-Muslim markets, you have countries like, China, like Thailand in Singapore, there's a halal law. Halal is protected. So then you can have more similar to Indonesia, the branding. I come from Holland. Halal is not protected, right, in the law. In Europe, it's not protected. And there, you have to be very careful how to brand halal and, uh, and, and how to brand it halal for the, uh, for the people, for your consumers in the market. Yeah, yeah so it's quite complex. So, you know. Thank you, Professor. It's another question that is uh, similar, but from a, a different uh, point of view, I think, uh, from uh, Ibu Mutiara Utami, uh, who is from IPB University. And uh, she asks, in your opinion, what is the biggest challenge in entering the halal food industry from a non-halal country's point of view? So that, you know, getting into a, a, a Muslim uh, market. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think, uh, so if you are, producing a non-Muslim country, then exporting to Indonesia. Uh, first of all, uh, 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 it is very difficult to find uh, the right information um, in non-Muslim markets about halal. Okay, so it is difficult to find uh, uh, what, uh, what is required to export uh, to, to Indonesia and Malaysia. What halal certificate to use? And so there are certification boards in Holland. They always say, use my halal certificate in Holland because uh, with my certificate, you have access. And they're not always giving you the right advice. So uh, the complexity of, of uh, who to choose, what is the best halal certificate to use. Also, uh, to, to develop the halal assurance system. Uh, and so it's important uh, to, to make the right decision on which halal certification body or combination of certification bodies to choose for and develop your halal assurance system. So those two are key and they are most difficult yeah, to, to, to get clarity on that in, uh, in uh, non-Muslim countries. I'll, I'll uh, ask one more question and then let uh, Aldi uh, continue on that. This is from uh, Dr. Restu Shamsul Hadi. Um, what are the challenges and opportunities in halal business? Uh, sorry, let's just say, I was looking at a different one here. Um, uh, I think that the, it's, no, it is the right. What are the challenges and opportunities in halal business? What are your suggestions for beginning business people to seize these opportunities? Uh, well, I shared with you uh, one of my first slides on where are the opportunities. So where are the problems mm. in the halal industry? Uh, right. I think there's a shortage of ingredients in additives. So, Indonesia is blessed with volcanic soil, right? In the Middle East, if you throw a seed on the ground, it will die because it's all sand. In Indonesia, if you put a seed on the ground, it will grow. Yes. And so you are blessed with a lot of natural resources, which you should leverage. Uh, Indonesia has a lot of uh, labor, people well-educated. We have top universities in Indonesia. So I think um, uh, leveraging the, the natural resources and the people skills in Indonesia, uh, that, that would be a good start. Also good to realize that you have to uh, move towards halal excellence. Mm. Uh, and, and that is important. So if you want to bring halal beyond Indonesia, bring halal to the world. So the starting point should be good already. It is like building a house, right? You have to make sure that you put the right foundations into place. So no compromises on ingredients, no compromises on, on processes. Uh, so building the right foundations is extremely important. So, so that I think education is important to, to give new entrepreneurs uh, that insight on halal business management, on what are those foundations, what you need to address. 
uh, yeah, so get your foundations right and, and focus on where the problems are in the halal industry. And, and those are all my slides. And there might be even more than those. Keeping to that main theme of excellence. Definitely. Yeah. Aldi, are there other questions? I'm sure there are. Yes, yes, there are many. Uh, and I want to share this one. Uh, okay. Here's a question from Dianti Arudi. Uh, she is a, uh, a small business consultant. How does one promote halal requirements to small businesses? Um, well, the beauty of, uh, uh, of uh, the Indonesian uh, halal logo is that it is recognized worldwide. Yeah, so to, to educate them on the requirements from uh, Majlis Islam Indonesia, uh, uh, BPA PH is already uh, good. Um, what I see, there are a lot of problems with small businesses is, is not necessarily on the halal side, but more on the quality management system. So uh, the foundation is normally the biggest challenge with micro SMEs and as, SMEs. So work, I think work 80% with the company on the quality management system. There's a build excellence also in the QMS, and then you put halal excellence on top of it. So uh, I always say uh, your, your quality management system is your basis, and then you put your halal assurance system on top. And with uh, the issue is micro SMEs, and SMEs is that, that uh, QMS is often not good. So 80% of your effort should be on the QMS, 20% on your halal assurance system. Very good. Uh, here's another one. Uh, how to increase knowledge of society to develop halal business and make them understand that halal business will give bigger benefit for uh, Tricky uh, question. Um, uh, what you see at a lot of uh, seminars, uh, we always share uh, the size of the halal market, uh, the food, uh, cosmetics, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, had a dollar value. Uh, the multinationals are already convinced. You know, the biggest halal food companies are the, the names I gave you earlier. The same in cosmetics. So the non-Muslim world says already, you know, we go halal. There is the opportunity. There's only the Muslim world that still needs to wake up. You know, the opportunity is there and, and you have the people, you have the natural resources. It's a matter of building those halal assets. It is, is building the new multinationals and therefore the, the ecosystem we are building, the, the, like in modern halal valley, we have an, um, a program for entrepreneurs. So we be coaching the entrepreneurs. Uh, we are coaching those businesses. Uh, IBMI will be educating on halal business management. Uh, so it is a matter of coaching, training, creating the ecosystem. Uh, the, the support from the Indonesian government, uh, from uh, uh, KNEKS on giving incentives to halal industries to make it easier to, to set up a company in a halal business. I have a lot of business idea. I would love to set up a new company in Indonesia to create new businesses. So how easy is it for foreigners like myself to set up a company in Indonesia in the halal space. So, so this is also effort required from the Indonesian government in, in making it easier to set up a company. Um, Singapore is very good. I mean, it cost me two sing dollars to set up a company in Singapore. You know, very easy, very easy process. So, so these are things that has to be re-looked at also uh, to give SMEs opportunities uh, to start new businesses. Uh, so a lot of work uh, can be done, but the opportunities are there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, here's a, a, from a different angle. Uh, Erwin Susanto Sadirsan uh, is asking, um, is halal certification a must for export to the Middle East? Uh, uh, yes, it is. Um, the Middle East, uh, uh, in the early days, uh, years ago, um, uh, was not very particular uh, on halal. If it came from a Muslim uh, majority country like Indonesia, it was okay. No halal certificate required. It has been changing very fast. Uh, I have been the advisor also to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on halal industry development. Uh, also, I've been a lot in Dubai, working also in Muslim markets in the Middle East. 
um, Muslim countries, Islamic countries in, uh, in the Middle East, those countries are developing halal standards, mm -hmm. uh, halal logos, halal certification. Mm -hmm. um, so it is important to be uh, proactive uh, for companies and get halal certified. So if you want to do business uh, in in the uh, Middle East, you need to be halal certified. And also uh, you have to meet probably a lot of other halal uh, or quality standards like like food safety uh, has up uh, but halal definitely no. okay well uh, you've touched upon uh, this several times um, but it seems that uh, halal certification is different from one country to another uh, and why is that that's a question from Fajar Satria um, uh, Do they well, different halal measurements? So there are more than uh, 400 halal certification bodies in the world, which is estimated. There's no international database of uh, halal certification bodies, it's just an estimate. Um, so why are there different halal standards? So uh, halal standards are being developed by, uh, by governments, Islamic governments, they are developed by NGOs. In non-Muslim countries, they are developed by a mosque or a company. And uh, they all create their own requirements. And the halal standards are based on uh, the ruling Islamic school of thought, uh, local fatwas, but also local customs, uh, which are different uh, in different countries. And the result is, uh, yes, there are 400 different halal certification bodies and yeah. also 400 different standards. Um, there is an, um, uh, a program in now currently in Turkey, in the SMIC, that they want to harmonize halal standards. So Indonesia is also an active uh, participant in, uh, in the SMIC uh, to make sure that, that halal standards can be harmonized. But it's a long process and, um, and it is very sensitive. Yeah? So, so Muslims uh, in Indonesia, you have your own regulatory system. And you will look differently at Malaysian products and the same for Malaysia, how they look at Indonesian products and Brunei, how they look at Indonesian products. And, um, uh, and yeah, that uh, everybody has its own fatwa committee. So it's a long process. And I hope, uh, God willing, uh, is that we can create one halal standard. There is only one halal, uh, one Islam. So hopefully there can also be one day also one halal standard, which will be important. Uh, for to simplify halal trade to produce halal for the world um, there are attempts uh, being done but it, it, it's a long process difficult process it talks about negotiation about what is required in terms of the halal standard um, indonesia has one of the the most advanced halal standards the the, the of the oldest halal standards also was is one of the first developing halal standards Middle East are only now looking at developing over the past last three, five years are looking at halal standards. So there's different level of maturity, different points of view. Uh, it's, uh, it's complex. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we, it's, it's an ongoing process uh, and it's all about harmonizing and uh, they're sitting on the table somewhere to do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here's a, a, a question from Adrian Satyanugroho. Is there a logistic halal certification body in Indonesia? Do you know? Um, so the, it's a good question. Uh, so uh, halal logistics can be certified under the existing halal standard of Indonesia, the HAS 23000. So uh, we helped uh, uh, in Indonesia a logistic company like in uh, Tanyong Priok. Uh, we have uh, IPC logistic services. Uh, so they are certified under the HAS 23000. So the, the existing Indonesian halal standard allows for a certification of, uh, of logistics operations. It is a great standard to, to, to be used for that. Okay. Um, so it's, it's also a working uh, in process. Uh, but here's another question uh, uh, with regard to logistics. What is the advantage for uh, a logistic company to be halal certified? Question by uh, Yeah, uh, excellent uh, question. Um, I can make a prediction for logistics companies, 
right, that are not halal certified by next year will not be allowed to do fa FMCG, fast moving consumer goods distribution um, for the big companies. Wow. Uh, it, is already, it is already mandatory according to the HAS 23,000, according to the Indonesian halal standard, that halal needs to be segregated in transportation and storage. It is, I repeat, it is already a requirement for brand owners that the halal certified for their products um, uh, according to the Indonesian standard, the HAS 23,000, it is mandatory to segregate in their purchasing, in their distribution, halal from non-halal in storage and transportation. This means that also by your logistic service provider, it needs to be compliant. So your logistic service provider uh, would be better if your logistic service provider is certified, because if you're non-compliant, MUI or BPPH could take the hollow certificate away from that brand owner. Mm. So the big brand owners cannot afford to lose the hollow certificate by doing business with a logistics company that doesn't care about halal. Let it put halal together with non-halal beverages or products. So from a risk management point of view, big brand owners will only do business with logistics companies that are halal certified. So if you want to be in the business of halal distribution, get your halal certificate. Thank you. That's a very important message then. But uh, still, in, in the same area, Anna Maria Sri Asi asked, uh, what are... Uh, are there any difference between resilience in halal supply chain and conventional supply chain? Uh, obviously, she is in the supply chain business. How to design a resilient halal supply chain system? And what are the critical points that should be prioritized in designing resilient halal supply chain? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Ms. Anna Maria, for this question. I'm, uh, I did my PhD on uh, on halal supply chain management to create an halal uh, supply chain model for this. Uh, conventional halal supply chain designs are, are not always uh, the most robust and resilient uh, halal supply chain. And so it is important to, uh, uh, to design uh, your supply chain, choosing the right partners in your supply chain, also uh, create a document of your of your supply chain, uh, documentation, uh, create key performance indicators in your supply chain to measure the performance that ensures that your supply chain is robust and also uh, resilient. Uh, also, cooperation in the supply chain is important. So how do you collaborate with partners, with other industries uh, to be more, uh, to act more uh, on halal issues uh, when you talk about resilience? And so halal supply chain robustness and resilience is done by design, by design of your supply chain blueprint. Okay, so uh, like the title of this uh, webinar, uh, we should really design our business, whether it's uh, the uh, the, in the pr product and or uh, as a part of a supply chain and we have to design it as to, to be halal uh, is that correct professor yeah so it's uh, similar uh, like your quality management system you also have to develop uh, proper guidelines uh, standards uh, process and procedure regarding halal um, so it is professionalizing halal, going beyond uh, the conventional requirements of your halal certification body to really embed halal excellence in your processes. Uh, because halal excellence is a process, a pursuit to excellence, and halal excellence. is a process. Yeah. Okay. Aldi, uh, yeah, but... uh, uh, we have a question from uh, Mustafa. Uh, uh, you talked about the... Uh, um, uh, no compromise in, in, in these excellent, uh, and you mentioned people as uh, one of the major components. Uh, how does one uh, get that uh, 
excellent. I mean, is that normal HR or is there a specific uh, uh, halal way to get the uh, excellence in, in, in people? Uh, thank you for this question. Um, so if you talk about people, it's, it's your staff, your team. Yeah? So education is important. So uh, do you have an onboarding training? And a lot of onboarding programs uh, don't talk or talk very little about halal. So in your onboarding of new staff, it's important that all your staff is also trained on the halal side. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then every year, what training you give to your staff. Uh, and then also your board members yeah, for a lot of decisions are made by big companies, by the board of directors. So is the board, uh, do they understand halal, right? Not just halal from a relig religious point of view, but also like on, on halal business management. Uh, uh, what data is given to the board uh, of directors? Um, so education is extremely important of the people in your organization, uh, your staff, the board members, but also your suppliers, uh, your partners in business or your logistic service providers. Uh, the logistic service provider might be halal certified by a halal standard. But you as a brand owner, you establish your halal DNA, you establish your own business processes. So you have to make sure that your logistic service provider is aligning his operations to your halal assurance system and your halal supply chain design. Although your logistics service provider is halal certified, you still need to make sure that he is following your halal assurance system and your halal business processes. So education is your own team, but also your external partners. Thank you for that. Ali, can you take it away? Yes. Um, here's another one. And uh, this is something that is close to your research also, Professor Timan. Ratna Mustika asks, what is the relation of blockchain with traceability? Um, yeah, so I have been um, doing research on using blockchain technology for halal supply chains uh, in the University of Malaysia Pahang in the Kwantan, which I'm still uh, sideways, uh, so a little bit involved in at this point in time, and there will be some new publications soon coming on this. Uh, any tra uh, any uh, IT system uh, 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 can uh, can have uh, traceability, and blockchain has that as part of that system uh, traceability in there. Uh, that is that is great uh, traceability. Um, uh, so blockchain can give traceability of where does the product come from, where did it go to, which is an important component. Uh, how we also use blockchain is to automate actions. Uh, so you can do make faster, uh, distribute information in the case of a hollow issue. You can give information to the hollow certification body uh, for verification. So it makes also hollow certification easier. Uh, also for the halal certification board, if they have access to a blockchain of a brand owner. Um, so I think on one side, uh, you can use blockchain for traceability. I think blockchain has the potential to go far beyond traceability. But we also have to be careful uh, by uh, making things mandatory uh, because uh, the halal industry also in Indonesia is dominated by a lot of micro SMEs and SMEs which might not have and the benefit of an advanced uh, IT system. Uh, so from the Holy Quran, we also learn that God doesn't want to create unnecessary hardship. So we have to be very careful by introducing uh, complex IT systems, which are beautiful for the IT company to be involved in, uh, but maybe very expensive and impossible for some micro SMEs and SMEs to, to be part of. Uh, so from day one, and also I was involved in an in international halal uh, logistics standard, we are always very um, careful in making uh, traceability requirements very uh, hefty uh, because it would uh, eliminate uh, some small companies. And it should not be our, uh, our intention. Uh, our intention is to, to, to allow micro SMEs and SMEs to join the halal industry. Um, so uh, we have to be very careful by introducing, uh, I think, traceability. Uh, it should be halal by design and not halal by proving that uh, having IT that we know where it came from. 
so I think that's why I'm, I'm preaching uh, uh, halal excellence by design and, and make it sure that it is halal by design and not that you have to prove it by an IT system that it was halal. Um, so the starting point should be, first of all, uh, create a robust and resilient uh, uh, halal business management and, and excellence everywhere. Um, yeah, so that's my comment on that. Well, uh, I must add, you also mentioned before, uh, the, the D, it has to start from the DNA. So it designs from, design from the very beginning then. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that is uh, the extent of our question and answer uh, for today. I, you have answered a lot of questions. Are there, are there more, Valdi? Uh, 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 yes, but they're yeah. redundant to others. Yeah, I was just going to um, uh, ask uh, Professor Tiemann whether or not uh, we can later on, if if there are, um, if to to capture the other questions, that we could uh, do um, uh, a, a, a kind of personal interview with you with those particular questions, and then we can upload it in uh, in YouTube for those people to 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 to, to look at. If yeah, that would be excellent idea. I think we should do that. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Well, that that will take care of uh, hopefully uh, most of the questions. And I must say, uh, the questions and your answers indicate the complexity of what is uh, needed. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, it, it's a kind of a universal uh, quest uh, for um, for that excellence. And but that needs to be in the DNA in itself in order to look for the uh, So uh, I think there's a lot of uh, food for thought, and that uh, perhaps uh, we, uh, later on we can uh, explore that in our various uh, activities uh, together. Uh, Baldi, are we uh, ready for uh, Aman to, uh, to yes, vote? Yes, okay. yes. But before that, um, it seems that, that uh, like uh, you said. Uh, Paderi, there's a lot of interest here, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm getting suggestions of uh, different okay. talks uh, in the future mm -hmm. uh, because it seems that there are partners of uh, uh, KNA KS uh, in our midst, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they would like very much to uh, to have some times together with Professor Tiemann and also share in in such a forum that we have today. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Timon. Thank you very much, Professor Derry. Um, uh, before we close, uh, so last but not least, I would like to introduce to you, it means Executive Director. We'll close our progr program today. A former rector of IPB University, Professor Aman Wirakarta Kusumah, is also head of engineering commission of the Indonesian Academy of Sciences. He's also a newly appointed member of the scientific group of the UN Secretary General 2021 Food, Food System Summit. And Ambassador Wira Kartakusuma, who was Indonesia's ambassador and permanent representative to UNESCO in Paris. We indeed have very influential personalities from very different world stages today in our midst. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Aman Wira Kartakusuma. Professor Ahmad. Oh, you are muted, sir. Could you unmute first? You're still muted. You're still muted. Can someone help uh, unmute? Okay. Oh, there you go. There you go. Silakan, Prof. Sorry about that. Again, this technology always. <laughs> I was so impressed with uh, listening to what Professor Timan uh, deliver his uh, presentation today to us. Let me first uh, greet my seniors, Pak Sofian Awal, uh, Pak Mustafa, Pak Emil Arifin, and Pak Sultan Emir Hidayat, Prof Timan, of course, Pak Diri, Pak Aldi, and our colleagues at IPB and all participants. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, first, I would like to thank you, Pak Sutan Emir Hidayat, of 
Diana K. AES for his opening statement. Kayan uh, AES is always the, our big supporter for IP in conducting many studies and projects related to Islamic business. So IPMI has a very close relationship with uh, the office or uh, the institute where PAIM is working and has produced cases on Sharia banking and halal tourism. And even events such today on halal excellence by design in business management also conducted together with Kayan AKS. Uh, I would like to specifically thanking our speaker, great speaker today, Prof. Marco Timan, who has shared his great ex expertise on halal business management by design. It is an excellent presentation. Uh, I truly enjoy re listening to all important things about halal excellence and how industry could take this as a golden opportunity to the Islamic market all over the world. And also would like to happily announce to all of you that Prof. Timan has accepted our invitation to be a visiting scholar, senior fellow senior fellow at the IBI case center. And we will make this uh, as an official uh, invitation to you very soon. So we are looking forward in continuing relationship with you, Professor Timan. It's my great honor. Congratulations. congratulations also to Prof Timan on publishing your book on halal business management, a guide to achieving halal excellence. We are happy that to have this book available as our reference in IBMI library for IBMI Futures Halal Business Management Education programs, as mentioned uh, by Professor Timan in his last slide. IBMI indeed is a pioneer in case method English language MBA programs in Indonesia. So by having this uh, new branch of concentration on halal business management education programs, I hope that we can make IPMI also as one of the hub in the region. We are also examining the potential of, for a pioneering case method English language international oriented halal business managed program at the IPMI, where you mentioned that no education on halal food management at the moment. So I also like to hear your statement about halal and toyiban should be as a two side of a coin. So it is indeed, I came from the wood science technology, you know, education background. So I know that where we mostly concentrate on food and nutrition safety, which is Toyiban side. So now it is probably much easier for us to just combine these two things, Hal and Toyib into a, a programs. So we can have a com complete uh, full, uh, pictures of how that we can comply with this halal and toyiban uh, uh, requirement. And as a partners, we also would like to see the future uh, new collaboration with kind of KAS in contributing to Indonesia and the world with regard to the halal business management programs. All the four pillars mentioned by Pa Emir about supply chains, financial sectors, small and medium enterprises, digital economy, are all applied to halal excellence by design. These are education programs that cover end to end from purchasing all the way to the utilization, even at the household uh, scale. So <clears throat> at this uh, juncture, I would like to invite both Pa Emir and Prof Timan to become advisors for the task force that we are setting up to organizing such a programs to ensure the best possible outcomes in IBMI. So I would like also to invite everybody here to provide their thoughts on such program, which is really truly needed by, by us in the country. So finally, thank you, Pak Adiri and Pak Aldi for organizing this event. 
And once again, thank you to Pa Emir and Prof Timan, uh, to all the team. I think this is an excellent program, and we are looking forward to seeing you again in the near futures in the EP Minars event. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi Thank, thank you very much, Professor Amandira Kartakusuma. Uh, before I close, I would like to remind you that please do fill the post in our questionnaires, please, and especially for those wanting or needing an e-certificate. Do not forget to say so on the form and note you need to transfer the e-certificate fee to the address in the form. What uh, about the traditional photo? Um, Oh yes, Ibu Opit, Yemas, can you uh, help us with the traditional photo of the uh, okay. participants, please? There is four pages, so I will take one by one. Okay. Okay. The first one is one, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Opit. You have a nice photo as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope to see you all again in our next webinar, which will happen next week. Uh, the topic will be on family business uh, uh, of Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Thank you. We'll get in touch very soon. Okay. And keep thank in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you. Very positive. Keep Bye. up the good work. Thank you, Pak Sofian. Thank you, Pak Ali. Thank you. Very good attendance, you know. I think at the beginning I saw it's more than 100. And yes, 109. 109. Increase again, more than 100. Yeah. yeah. That's great. For the photo. <laughs> For the photo. <laughs> wow. Uh, back to work. We have a lot of things to do. That's okay. right. Back, back to, to sleep. Back to sleep. <laughs> We get the uh, evaluation, oh, yeah. evaluation uh, assessment. Mm -hmm. assessment. Right, everybody seems to be leaving. Yep. Okay. All right, thank you. Very, very good, by Aldi. Yeah, excellent. And Aldi has not slept and yet, still. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, team. Ebolia, Opet, Leafy. Uh, Arini, yeah. uh, Fajri, Ehwan, yeah. Awan. So no panic. Uh, everything is just in the right. Yes.